thank you everybody for coming. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you guys are all like safe and happy and healthy. Uh, and thank you for joining us as we honor and pay tribute to these five amazing ladies, um, luminaries in our industry, some would say, I would say, and breast oh, cancer survivors. Um, and so thank you panelists for being a part of this conversation. I think it's going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. So um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys for being a part of this panel. Um, I, I can introduce the panelists uh, as we go uh, as we go through it. Um, it this is going to be every everybody has had just kind of amazing careers on this panel, and I had to. I, I'm sorry that I had to like whittle it down to you know just kind of like things, but you know how it goes. You know how it is. Uh, Ramsey, <laughs> Ramsey, I'll start with Ramsey Naito. Uh, Ramsey is the president of Nickelodeon Animation. Woo! Well done, well done. Holy moly. <laughs> uh, joining the company in just 2018. I think that was two years ago. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Ramsey is an Oscar nominated producer um, and she received her Bachelor's of Fine Arts in the Maryland Institute of College of Art, which is cool. And her Master's of Fine Art at CalArts which is also cool. Awesome, thank you, Ramsey. Thank you for being a part of this panel. Um, Allison Mann. Allison, I've known for a long time. She's the VP of Creative and Strategy at Sony Pictures Animation. Um, and she began her career at Nickelodeon. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hey, man. <laughs> this is all of us. <laughs> all <laughs> of us lead back to Nickelodeon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> As a finance intern while attending, while attending school, like Columbia College in Chicago. So uh, um, on the East Coast and, uh, and Allison has since worked at Walt Disney Animation Studios, Paramount and Illumination, just to name a few. Also Zynga as well, like being in the uh, games industry. Mm -hmm. um, and she's also, I just wanted to mention that she's Allison is the co-founder and CEO of uh, BRIC Foundation, B-R-I-C uh, Foundation. And that initiative is rad. Um, it, it, it aims to create new access points for women and, and underrepresented groups to excel at creative leadership, which is, man, right up our alley. Um, and uh, on brand with Rise of Animation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my homie, uh, Stevie Wormer Skeleton, uh, I love this woman. Um, she's currently a director mm -hmm. and story person at Walt Disney Television Animation. Um, and she goes, she's, she's got like, uh, she's got some experience with, she worked on some classic films like uh, Pocahontas, starting with Pocahontas. Is that right, uh, Stevie? Correct me. That's right. Me. And that was yours, uh, your first one as well, right, Monica? Yes, that's when we met. So I've known hey. Stevie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Listen, classics, Pocahontas, Fantasia 2000, Emperor's New Groove, Tarzan, Brother Bear, <laughs> Princess and the Frog, I can go on and on. But, uh, and also she kind of co-directed, she kind of, she co-directed with Kevin Dieters, the prep and lining TV holiday specials that we all know and love. Um, so, by the way, shame, shameless plug here is uh, on Disney Plus now. So, hey, <laughs> well done, well done, well done. So excited. <laughs> that is exciting. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and then we have uh, Belinda Sue. Um, thank you for being here, Belinda. Uh, uh, Belinda is the vice president of finance and operation at Disney Animation Studios currently. Um, and, but she started her career in finance working for Goldman Sachs, which is, I don't even know what that means, uh, investment banking in New York City. So imagine, imagine Belinda in like a Wolf of Wall Street situation before she came into animation. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. Um, but uh, um, after moving to Los Angeles and uh, Belinda transitioned into working into entertainment finance for animation studios like DreamWorks, Disney Toon Studios, Disney TVA, and currently Disney uh, Animation Studios where she worked on Tangled, Frozen, and Moana. Um, so, which is amazing, <laughs> amazing left turn. 
Um, and uh, finally, we have our, um, our moderator, Monica Lego Cadis. There's a helicopter going by, and that's perfect. Lago, Lago Cadis. I know it's hard. Lago Cadis. Lago that's Cadis. Great. Sorry, Mon. Uh, Don't be teasing about it. <laughs> I've only known uh, Mon for, you know, 20, 20 years. Yeah, 20 plus years. And uh, I've never said her name um, to her in person. So no. now we're figuring this out for the first time in uh, history. Uh, <laughs> Monica is the C currently the CEO producer of Frogbot Films um, and one of the founders of Rise of Animation. Hey, Monica! She keeps us on our toes and she made this panel happen. <laughs> uh, Monica graduated from Cal State University, Los Angeles. Cool. Yep. That's, I, I don't know anyone that went to that school. Um, and uh, How you do? that, Sorry? I said, now you do. Now I do. I know one person. <laughs> uh, Monica joined the Disney Animation Studios, like we said before, on the film Pocahontas in 1994. Um, and uh, went on to work on both CG and 2D films like Hercules, Meet the Robinsons, uh, Princess and the Frog, Record Ralph, and Zootopia. Um, and then after Disney, uh, Monica made her live action debut with Netflix's um, the Christmas Chronicles with her partner and creative partner, uh, Clay Cadis, um, amazing guy, a, you know, a longtime Disney animator. And um, Frogbot Films continues to develop live action and animation properties through um, their company. So um, they're pushing forward and, and like doing new things. So it's an honor to have you guys here. Um, I, uh, and I, uh, I'm really appreciative and I can't wait to hear the discussion. So Monica, you can take it away. And thank you, thank you Bobby. Mm -hmm. so right, that took like two hours. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I know Ramsey's like, I, I gotta go. Um, so, <laughs> it's true. I wanted to say thank you to the ladies for joining me today. Um, I wanted to, uh, say thanks for joining Rise Up Animation for this important panel. For those of you who don't know, October is actually Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and Rachel, who's a lead for our panels, wondered if we should do something. And I think it was Trent, who one of our, you know, our other founder who said, you know, we actually have a founder who had breast cancer. Let's do something. And unfortunately, we couldn't do it until today because I just had another reconstructive surgery, um, you know, which is is one of kind of the things that can happen to a lot of us after breast cancer. So I had that October 19th. So we had to wait a little bit. So thank you all for your patience. Um, and it's just lovely to see you guys all here because I know each of you from in such a different way. Like I, I've known Stevie the longest. We both started at Disney together. I worked with Allison Mann at, at Disney. Of course, I worked with Belinda. And now I'm meeting Ramsey in a different way because I'm, well, not only are we uh, both um, at the Producers Guild of America, we're both working on a working group for BIPOC, to rise BIPOC people in animation and visual effects, but we're also doing something that we can't talk about yet <coughs> Nick, with Nick and maybe Rise Up Animation. <laughs> no spoilers. Um, but anyway, so, you know, there's so much we could talk about and I know we don't have, you know, a ton of time. And so I'm, I want to be really respectful of your guys' time, but I think it's really important to let people know um, kind of where were we in our careers leading up to our diagnosis. And so we're going to start in order of people being diagnosed. So Allison was the first of our group to be diagnosed in January of 2014. So Allison's going to go first. So I was 34 years old when I first got diagnosed. I was working at um, Disney Interactive. And so I had just I had just gotten married. I had been working at Disney Interactive, I think, for about a year and a half. And um, and I went in for a kind of a, my first mammogram because my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer in her 40s. And you always want to go, they always recommend going a, a decade prior. And I actually had to push my doctor to get me my mammogram. And... Um, and it took uh, probably six months, six to eight months for her, for me to like constantly be telling her to give me this, this mammogram. And so I went in and then um, I got the mammogram, which is very uncomfortable, um, very squishy. 
And then I got a call later that they wanted me to come back because I had, they said I had dense tissue. And I thought, well, maybe that's a compliment, but it didn't really, I don't know. I was like, I don't know what dense tissue was. So, um, so I went back in and they um, ended up wanting to do a biopsy. And I feel like maybe at that point, I thought um, that didn't feel like the best sign, even though they all kept telling me it was okay. Um, I remember looking, um, there was a um, image of my mammogram up on the screen where they were going to do the, the biopsy. And um, I could see all these different areas. Um, it, and they're like, no, don't worry about it. It's totally fine. I was like, I think you guys are lying to me, but and trying not to get me to worry. That's horrible. So, yeah, so I remember it was very uncomfortable. Um, there was like, I don't know, you, you remember certain markers, there was like this ugly flower painting on the wall and um, they were just poking and prodding me and that was done. And I, I think it was maybe a, less than a week later, I was in the office um, at Disney Interactive and I got a phone call from my doctor and they said I had cancer. And I remember having a complete breakdown. I was in hysterics. Um, I, at this point, I didn't know like stage or anything else. So um, probably a few days later, I went in to see my breast surgeon who told me I had stage zero um, uh, DCIS, which is um, stage zero is when it doesn't, it's, it's non-invasive. It didn't go past uh, the ductal tubes in my um, in my my boob um so it was localized to there but it was spread everywhere um and so the breast surgeon recommended that i would get a uh mastectomy um so she really only told me to do a, a single but i'm a uh, vain and i didn't want lopsided boobs plus um since my mom had breast cancer i just want to get rid of both because i never wanted to worry about again so um, I, I opted for a double mastectomy. And then, um, so I went through, through all of um, the operations um, and they, there's different ways you can reconstruct. But for me, they put implants in directly and I ended up getting an infection. So I was only supposed to take maybe um, a less than a month off of work. It ended up being three months because I ended up getting a staph infection that almost killed me. So then um, it was a, it was a day that there was an earthquake. I had to, I was rushed into the hospital with 103 fever. If they didn't catch it, me and kept if I hadn't caught it in time, I, I would have died. Um, and then they um, did the surgery, took out the uh, the implant to let me heal. But right before I was on the gurney with um, IV stuck to my, my arm. It was like 6.30 in the morning. And all of a sudden there was like a 6.0 earthquake. And I was like, well, fuck, if, if, if uh, breast cancer is not gonna kill me, California will. I was like, everything was, like there would be nothing I could do. Like everything would have collapsed on me if that earthquake was there. So like, I was like, well, this is it. But the earthquake subsided, I got the surgery. And then I was without a boob for like a month. And then that was really bizarre to just be without one. And then I ended up um, getting reconstruction about a month later after that heal healed. And, and then I was back to normal and back to work. I didn't need chemo, radiation. Um, I wasn't on any cancer drugs. So after um, all of that, I had never seen my doctors again. And that was, then I kept on working and, and, and going through it. So that's the end of her story. We're actually going to come back to Allison. Um, I'm actually the second person that was diagnosed in June 2014. And uh, I went to Allison. She was actually one of, the, one of the first people that I went to to ask for guidance. And I'm going to tell my story, but I'm going to tell it later because I can stay on and, and other people have hard out. So next would be Ramsey, who was diagnosed in 2015. You don't want to go for wait are you you go ahead you go ahead i'll tell my i'll go last because it's i i, I don't i it's really more important for for me to hear your lady stories um, I so i um was 
working at Blue Sky, I was living in New York City. I got a routine mammogram and they found some dense air. I had some dense fibrous tissue in my breast. But I also, they found some, some, uh, something that could be confused with calcifications. And so they said, you know what, it's probably not cancer, but it might be. So you should come back in six months and um, we should compare and th that will tell us a lot. I ended up not going back in six months and moving back to LA to produce Boss Baby. It made me like a year and a half, a year later, maybe a year and a half later, I got a mammogram in LA and um, they found cal they found the same thing, shipped my, my uh, mammogram from New York to Cedar Sinai, um, where they could compare the mammograms, and that's it was cancer. So, um, but it was stage zero. Um, you know, it's interesting because I never, uh, I've never really spoken about this whole experience until now, really in public, really. And at the time, I don't think I even told anyone that I was diagnosed. I told very few people. Um, I was on Boss Baby and it was a strange reaction. And I, from what I understand from other cancer survivors, it's a, it's a, a textbook reaction. Often you just don't tell anyone. Yes. You don't want anyone to talk to you about it. <laughs> you don't want anyone to ask you how you are or feel bad for you or what, what have you. So I told very, very few people while I was on on Boss Baby. Um, um, but then I got a biopsy, which was maybe the most painful part of the entire experience. Be yes. and, and I remember being very critical of the experience because they put you on a, on a bed that has a divot in it and you're, it's really not shaped to your body at all. It's like, it's the strangest thing with a hole in it and you put your boob through it and you're strapped down and it's like someone shoots a bow and arrow into your boob. And I remember thinking, no one warned me about this. <laughs> it was like the worst experience ever. Um, but then what they found was that the cancer, the cells had moved through my lymph nodes. And so it went to stage one. Um, I then got a, a lumpectomy. Um, I had radiation for, you know, I can't remember to be honest, but it was every day yeah. during lunch. Um, so I would disappear from Boss Baby every day during lunch and go back after radiation. Um, and I think it was like 12 weeks. I think it was yeah. a long time. Long time. And, I, and I had a choice to do chemo or, uh, or no chemo. So I chose not to do chemo. Um, and then I was on tamoxifen, tamoxifen for about five years. Um, and so... And, kind of and you're cancer-free? You're good? Cancer-free, no tamoxifen. Tamoxifen was also a horrible experience. <laughs> I want to um, I'm on it. We'll I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's awesome. And do you still get checked? How regularly do you get checked? Now it's once a year. Okay. It was every six months, and now it's once a year. Yeah. And I'm actually due to go. Yeah. You are due. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you go. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for sharing your story. We're going to come back around and talk about how it impacted work a little bit more because I think what you just said is so right on. It's such a personal experience. It's such a personal journey that it is each, you know, and not just women get breast cancer, men do too. Um, I just didn't know of any men who came forward so I couldn't ask them to join, but every, it's, it's a very individual decision how you handle it and what you talk about. So, um, so Belinda, you were actually next, May 2015. Yeah, so I think for me, um, I grew up always thinking that you were supposed to get a mammogram at the age of 35, because at one point in time, that was the recommended. So when I turned 35, I went to my OBGYN, I very clearly asked, I want my mammogram. And she asked me, are you feeling okay? Do you have any family history of breast cancer? And I said, no, but that's just what I'm told. I'm supposed to get one at 35. And she said to me, oh, no, the American Medical Board changed that, and now they're recommending 40. So that was it. It was like I was dismissed and then I didn't have a case to argue against that. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm feeling great. 
So when I turned 40, I said to myself, I guess that's, you know, facetiously looking back, I'm like, oh, that should be my birthday present to myself this year. So I called my OBGYN. I asked for the mammo. She gave me the prescription for it. I went in and a week later, I got a letter through the mail, similar to Allison and Ramsey. You have dense breast tissue. We don't have a baseline. It's probably nothing. Please come in so we can redo the mammogram. So I went back in the first week of May um, and they redid the mammogram on the side where they found it to be suspicious and they cleared it. However, there was a radiologist on site and she, I don't know what it was, but she said, you know what? I just want to be more careful and I want you to do an ultrasound. So right then and there, she got me into the next room and I got an ultrasound and sure enough, they found something. So immediately she recommended a needle biopsy. So we, we ended up doing that right then and there. I was completely freaked out just thinking I was going to go back and they were going to clear me. I, I remember I did the, the appointment in the morning thinking that I can rush back in time to make the rest of my meetings for the day. But I found myself driving home, calling my friend who also at the time was working with me on Moana. And I said, I don't have a good feeling about this. I think I really need to take the rest of the day. And sure enough, the next day I got the call from um, the center and they said, yes, you have invasive lobular carcinoma. So I was told 85% of breast cancer diagnoses is usually ductal uh, breast cancer that occurs in, in the duct ducts of the breast, but the lobular one is, is where it's actually the milk producing glands is much harder to detect. So I use, you, I would actually be very good about doing self uh, breast examinations and I didn't find anything, didn't feel any lumps. So with it being in the lobular areas, it's very hard to um, detect, like I said. So even when I went to the breast surgeon, she couldn't even feel it. She didn't know where it was. So I, I, was, I was diagnosed with being stage one, and then they recommended an MRI to see, it was on my left breast, to see whether or not it was on both breasts or, or, or if there were other indications of cancer. So then um, I was upgraded to stage two because they did find another section. It was like the one I had was more like a dumbbell. So it was attached to another area. So just due to the size of the tumor, they upgraded my diagnosis to stage two. Um, and at the time I was struggling with um, whether or not to do a single mastectomy or a double because my other side was uh, pronounced clear. I remember asking my surgeon, I said, if it were you, what would you do? And she just said to me, I would do the single because your other breast is healthy. But then my next question was, okay, well, if I preserve the, the other breast, do I still need to do mammograms every year? And she said, yes. So that was what did it for me. I said, well, it was, my cancer was not detected through the mammograms. So I, I just right then and there being risk adverse, I said, just take them both. <laughs> At this time I had already, you know, had both my kids. I'd um, nurse both of them. And I, I literally just said, I, you know, from where I stand, I don't really need them for, for, you know, what I think they're meant to be at the time. I just was very practical. And so I opted for the double mastectomy um, and then, you know, further treatments along the way. So my treatment went all in six months. I did double mastectomy. I had the six rounds of chemo and I did not have to do uh, radiation because they did not find it in the lymph nodes. Oh, right. That's right. I remember, I remember because I was diagnosed before Belinda and I remember Belinda was like, you know, we talked a lot about it when it came up because we were all having kind of exams around the same time, uh, you and the colleague you speak of, and we were all getting kind of like, you've got to come in for closer look. So it's quite frightening. Um, thank you. So we'll circle back. So Stevie, you were September 2019. So our most recent survivor. Yes, yes. I'm fresh from the, fresh from the cancer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know, you, you're supposed to go in every year for your mammogram. And I had been told in the past that, um, I had had dense, I had dense breasts and, you know, I always say to people, oh, I always knew there was part of me that was dense, but I just didn't think that was my boobs. I thought it was, um, so, uh, at it sometimes people, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I got the thing in the mail saying you're due for your annual mammogram. And I was like, oh, okay. And you know, and you know, you get the stuff from the, from the insurance, from the doctor and stuff saying you need to come in. And I just got put on the pile of, okay, deal with that later kind of thing. Cause you know, your life gets busy. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll do that later. Um, 
So six months later, um, my sister, and I remember where I was, um, I was walking across, I was walking across the street in front of TVA animation. There's a, like a crosswalk there. You guys, I don't know. If I do know it. Yes. And, yeah. People like almost get hit all the time there. Cause I was going to lunch and I got a phone call from my sister and I'm walking on in the crosswalk and she, and she had gone and had her mammogram and she said, I have breast cancer. And I was like, what? And this was in August of 2019. Um, and I'm like, this is what, this is crazy. It doesn't run in our family. My mom doesn't, you know, nobody that I know had it. So, um, I thought, well, this is insane. So I was very supportive of her and said, I'll be here for you if you need anything. I think she had stage one. She had the, um, ductal, uh, invasive ductal carcinoma too. Um, and so she was in tears. So then, you know, I came home and I went, oh crap, I, it's been six months uh, it's, now that I've let this letter sit here, I should go get checked. So I made an appointment and went and had it done. And then a couple days later, I got a call. This was like a Friday uh, afternoon, evening. I came home and there was a message from my doctor. Um, and he just said, hi, you know, it's, it's your doctor. Um, yeah, give me a call. Uh, we just something we need to discuss. And that's all he needed to say. And from then on, I was just like, oh no. So my sister got diagnosed in August. I got diagnosed in a month later in September. Again, neither one of us, um, you know, nothing, no, nothing like this has ever happened. Cancer doesn't run in our family. Breast cancer doesn't run in our family. We don't have the gene, the, you know. Um, the BRCA. The BRCA gene. Um, so it was really weird, but you know, I, I tend to credit my sister for basically saving my life because if she hadn't have gone, she wouldn't have called me to tell me that she had it, that I would have, you know, and part of me thinks that if I had gone back in March of 2019, when I was scheduled to go, that they might not have even seen it because it was probably so small. So it was almost like fortuitous timing that I went in September and they actually found it. Um, and then um, I had to go in for an MRI after I saw the breast surgeon and they did an MRI and then they found cancer in the other breasts too. So I had it in both breasts um, and there are two different types of cancer as oh. well. Yeah. Would you want to say what types they are just for people? I don't know. even, <laughs> you probably know better. I, I had the, heard, yeah, I think you had, uh, I think you had hormone receptive and was it her? Her, her too. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one and the other. And, you know, so then I remember getting that call. I was out to lunch with my good friend, Dorothy McKim, and she's, my doctor called and said, yeah, you have any other breasts too? And I just was like, we were at Gourmet 88 in Glendale, right? <laughs> and I just was like, ah! and Dorothy didn't know what to do. And she was just like, oh, and she was hugging me and everything, you know, pre-COVID stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then I went in with my husband down to my breast surgeon and she, she told me what, what, what it was. And I, I don't think anyone ever told me what stage I was at. I think I was at two, but I don't know for sure. Um, and then I went and saw my breast surgeon and she was very matter of fact, she was awesome by the way, down at UCLA. And she was just like, okay, this is what's gonna happen. You know, you have a very good uh, chance of survival with this, this blah, blah, blah. And then she was like, you're gonna have to uh, get chemo. And then when she said chemo, I was just like, oh, that just, you know, it just drained my face. And I started, that's when I started crying. Um, and then she said, the best chance is for you to get a double mastectomy as well. And I was just like, I don't ever want it. Like, like you, you girls, you know, it's like, I don't ever want to have to deal with this ever again. Just take them. This, no one wants to go through this again. So, um, yeah. So, so then I did that and I did the, the MRI, the biopsy, the MRI biopsy. Did you guys have that? Oh my God, that's so painful. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was it's really it's like almost like a, I feel it's like a hole punch that's what I could think of like the old hole puncher it felt like they were hole punching it, oh it was just yeah you know, you into your boob you know oh, yeah. huh? <laughs> Man. It's, it's not pleasant no. uh, but yeah so that's that was my story and then I started chemo in November a year ago basically uh pretty much a year ago like two days ago last year um, finished in February and, um, yeah, so, okay. yeah. but no, no radiation for me. Um, my sister had to do radiation. Um, she did not like that, but still better than chemo, I think. But, um, 
Yeah. It's, and it's, so far I'm cancer free. So I go every three months now to see my oncologist. I was going to say, it's really, it is really interesting because some people have one or the other, you know, they'll either have a lumpectomy, a mastectomy, a double, maybe they'll have chemo, maybe they'll have radiation. It depends on everything. So I'm going to quickly just chat about my tail and then we're going to go back to Allison because Spoiler alert, Allison had a reoccurrence. She's actually the one person out of this group who's had a reoccurrence, which I think is one of our biggest fears, I think, as cancer survivors, is that when it does, if it does come back, um, doesn't mean you can't, you can't fight it, but it's just one of those things where you just never want to relive that. So we'll talk about that. Um, so I was 45. I was probably just finished Wreck-It Ralph, which was a, it was a stressful time at the studio, and I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't exercising. I was definitely not eating right. I'd gotten really heavy. And um, and actually my mother-in-law, Clay's mother, was diagnosed with breast cancer um, in 2013, like December, 2013. And so I was being her advocate and getting her the best doctors. Cause you know, I was born and raised here and all my, my doctors were in Beverly Hills. So I got her all these great doctors and, and they were all in Santa Monica. And so I realized, I think probably six months later that oh my God, I, I totally forgot about my mammogram. And I had never missed one, but I missed, I missed it. So I went in in May of 2014. And sure enough, they thought they saw something. And they asked me to come back for more views. And I'm like, it's just probably a calcium deposit. It's gotta be nothing. That's what my mother and my sister experienced. And I wasn't really thinking about my father's side of the family. I, I don't know why, but I wasn't. Um, which were Ashkenazi Jews, which are the ones, you know, who get the BRCA gene and we have other mutations. And so I, I wasn't thinking about that. So anyway, I went back in and sure enough, um, I went to the same doctors that I had sent my mother-in-law to and they're like, you look so familiar. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was just here with my mother-in-law. So they did the biopsy, same thing, really painful. I was, I was by myself because Clay had just moved to Vancouver for two years to work on Angry Birds to direct that. And I was, my mom was in Hawaii. And I remember just being like, this is unreal. And they were like, well, we want you to come back to Santa Monica to get your results. And I'm like, I am not driving all the way back here. I live in Glendale. I work at Disney Animation. You can call me. I mean, I'm not going to drive back here so you can tell me I have cancer and then I have to drive home for two hours and maybe get into an accident. So, so um, like three days later, I got the phone call. And I remember I was sitting, I was now on Zootopia. I was halfway through Zootopia. We had staffed. Hey, Dylan. The yep. Oh, sorry. You said, hey guys, oh, she went, Dylan, that's her husband. Um, we had staffed up Zootopia. We were kind of like the first year was done on the film. And, you know, I was already stressed out about the fact that my mother-in-law had breast cancer. Now I've, I'm reeling finding out that I, uh, I get a phone call. I'll never forget because my CG soup and some people were in the room and the doctor called and I said, oh guys, this is the call I've been waiting for. Um, I should probably clear the room. And she said, I heard her say to me, yes, you should. And so basically I was diagnosed with stage, um, they called it 2B, but really it's stage three breast cancer. And you couldn't, I couldn't feel it either. It was in my right breast and it was a very large mass, but it was down into the back. So you couldn't really feel it. It was really a trip. So um, then they found out that I was Ashkenazi Jew and I had to have all these genetic tests. And then we found out that I was quite high risk because of these other mutations I had. So I had, um, I took a poll. I was completely the opposite of Ramsey. I actually told everybody, like, I, I didn't tell everybody, but I asked people. I basically, I'm such a, I was such a production manager type man, um, you know, mentality that I was like, okay, if you were me, would you take the breast or wouldn't you? Like I went around to all these women. It was really kind of fascinating. They were amazing. And of course I went and had a meal with Allison who had just had hers. And she had just had the final. So I remember we went to dinner, we went into the restroom and she was like, here, I'll let you see what it's like. And I'm like, thank you. Because that's a really, you know, and I think I did the same thing for Belinda maybe at one lunch, right? I did. Can I just say, haven't we all flashed each other, you know, at some point? We have, uh, <laughs> we have, you know. That's what I look like now. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting once you've had like a double and a reconstruction that you don't, they don't, they're just not yours. They're, you don't really feel any, you don't feel them. So it becomes kind of this thing, but you also want to show this, an additional, you know, this person who's about to go through this, you know, the reality of things. And so um, anyway, I, my, my husband flew home that night. My mother luckily was coming to town just to visit. And she ended up staying for 10 months. She moved into my tiny little house and I ended up having 
hardcore chemo, the kind of chemo that they call the red devil, which I thought I was going to die. Like I got so, like you see in the movies, you know, my, everything shut down, all my organs. And I remember having conversations with my mother saying, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it. I'm, I hope I don't start crying. Sorry. And she just couldn't have that conversation at all. She would laugh at me. <laughs> Monica, just well, funny. My mother's never going <laughs> to she, and she'd go into the, her, her little room and cry apparently at night. I didn't, I didn't know. And then Clay would come home at night and I'd say, Clay, my mom won't listen to me. I, I think I might be dying. And he would just look at me and he'd say, I don't think that's going to happen. And I said, well, how do you know? And he said, I just see our life together. I see it. And it was really beautiful because, you know, then, because I was really ready to kind of quit halfway through chemo. I, I had like a mental breakdown. I mean, I was from all the medication they give you. Um, steroids and stuff. I couldn't sleep. So there, there became lots of collateral, I, I call it, kind of call it collateral damage, you know, that, that, that occurs when you go through such hard treatment. And then I did the same thing. I had radiation every day for probably a month and a half. And then I've had like three reconstructions since then. But um, I, you know, I'm just proud that, that I was able to get the help I needed. And I still go in even though I'm six years uh, cancer free, I am on tamoxifen. I have to be on it for 10 years. And I go in every four months actually to be checked just because I'm so high risk. I, I, the, the, um, the mutations that came back in my genetics means I could have uterine, ovarian, colon, all kinds of cancer. So they check me all the time. <laughs> um, aren't I lucky? <laughs> Um, but let's bring it back to, I will just say this, by sharing it with everyone at work, um, people were so loving and supportive, like most everyone. But I think the upper management at the time did look at me a little bit differently. They felt that, um, you know, they just think they can, people can sometimes look at you like you have, they have to treat you differently or kit gloves or, you know, that you're not as strong as you were. And so my advice to people is to never do that to somebody because, you, you know, I'm actually stronger than ever. Um, but Allison, why don't you tell us a little bit about your reoccurrence. So like I had mentioned before, I was 34 the first time. Sorry, um, children. Um, so I was 34 and one piece of it was um, during my, before they knew what stage I was and kind of what the full treatment should be, I had to go in to see a, um, a reproductive uh, doctor just to make sure to see Babe, I'm in a meeting. Uh, <laughs> Babe, I'm in a meeting with 40 people and they're recording it. <laughs> uh, COVID life. Um, so I was actually told by this doctor that I wouldn't be able to have kids. So I wasn't weren't really planning on it anyway, but she's like, um, I ended up not being needing to be on medication, but I was told um, by her and other people that I wouldn't be able to get pregnant on my own and I couldn't have kids. Um, so I had finished treatment, um, and then a year later, I actually got pregnant with twins on my own, uh, surprise. Uh, my husband and I didn't talk about it for about three months. And then I had the, the kiddos, and it was really awkward, at, and I was at Cedars. They kept feeling my boobs to see if I was going to start lactating, and I kept saying, like, I don't have boobs. These aren't real. Like, stop touching me. And they would be like, but there's no, there should be milk coming out. I was like, I'm telling you, there's no fucking milk gonna come out. I was like, they're not real. So you stop touching me. So that was like the most awkward, like, and a nurse. And I think, well, and I also think like when you're stage zero and you don't have chemo or radiation or some of the other and you don't lose hair, like I think people don't assume you're sick or you've gone through something traumatic. And then there's also when you are a stage zero survivor, it's um, like, you also have like, my cancer wasn't really that big of a deal. But I think no matter what stage, it's always a big deal. So uh, several years passed and I was actually um, on a girl's trip. Um, one of my really close friends was um, Melissa Roberts. I have a Claire Keen, Melissa Roberts, Deb Stone, Steph Morris, um, and we, um, Kelly Fountain, Maria, like we, we went um, for M Melissa's bachelorette party and we went to Joshua Tree. And I had been feeling very exhausted but I figured I was a mom and that was just my lot in life the rest of my life I was just supposed to be tired so I I just chalked it up to that and so we had been going hiking and I hadn't exerted my body in a long time since my surgeries and since having kids and we're hiking all over Joshua Tree 
Um, and I came back and I was sitting in bed with my husband and it was late and I'm like, oh man, my arm's really sore. I was like, it must be from like walking so much. And I just started kind of feeling underneath my arm on my left hand side where I had my cancer. And there was just like this lump. And I was like, and I asked my husband, I was like, do you feel that? And it was just by my armpit, like just right on the side right here. And he, uh, he's like, yeah. I, and, and so I texted my breast, brain breast surgeon, Dr. Itai, and um, she's like, well, can you come in tomorrow? And I said, yes. And so I went in and she did an ultrasound on it. And she's like, and it was like deja vu. It was a whole bunch of people all of a sudden telling me it's nothing. Don't worry about it. And she's like, so she did the ultrasound. She's like, yeah, I feel it, but it really doesn't look like anything. It's totally fine. And she's like, but let's go get a biopsy. And so I went and got a biopsy. And the biopsy people were like, really? It just, it feels like fatty tissue or something. Like, you know, you had a full mastectomy. They took everything out. And like the, the, the likelihood of my cancer coming back was 1%. 1% after that. 1%. So they were just being like basic precautionary and doing all these tests. And then, um, and then I didn't hear anything for a while. And somebody else who I know just got diagnosed, they felt the same way. They're like, well, I haven't heard anything for a while, so it probably is good news. And I was like, so I started thinking, well, if it was something bad, they would call me right away. And so at this point, I had actually, um, I was working in gaming, and I knew I wanted to go back into animation. So this was something like on a mental standpoint, like I started making sure because of having cancer that I was doing the things I wanted to do. So I went from working at Disney Interactive to Paramount Animation, and then I got recruited to work in Illumination. And it was 9 a.m. Uh, I was at Illumination. I was in the parking lot in my um, just like you, Monica, I start to get emotional about this. Uh, I um, got the call from my doctor and she's like, you have cancer again. And nice. And I didn't know the stage, but all I could start yelling was fuck, 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 fuck. Cause I had little kids and I didn't know if I was going to see them grow up. I didn't know. I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And it freaked me out. Cause I think it's one thing getting diagnosed at 34 with no kids. But then like having another diagnosis and having to go through all that and having them with you, it just give a different perspective. But um, it ended up being um, stage uh, two. Um, so I ended up having to go through all the operations again. Um, I ended up having to do chemo and radiation. And now I'm on cancer drugs for the next five years. Um, I'm on a drug trial. And I'm on an, uh, something called um, a, um, um, an estrazol. And um, I'm also, I have another, I get an injection um, as well that shuts my ovaries down. So I'm basically in menopause. I'm in constant pain every single day. My joints hurt. I have hot flashes um, as if you're going through menopause. Yeah, I just want to mention that there are, there, that, this is a really important piece of it because I also had a same similar protocol to Allison where they were giving me Lupron shots to shut down my ovaries and gave me kind of a, a pill that they generally give to women after they've been through menopause. And for six months, I was so miserable, so fucking miserable. I, I was so arthritic and I couldn't, when I'd go to get out of bed, it was like I was an 80 year old. It was bizarre. And so after six months, I went to see three, I got forget second opinions. I went and saw three more oncologists and they're all like, no, 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 you shouldn't be on that. You were, you were still, sorry to embarrass the man's, you were still menstruating when you got your, when you got diagnosed. So it shouldn't have shut, you know, don't get those shots and take tamoxifen. And that changed my life. So, so it's interesting to me because Ram, you know, Ramsey was like, tamoxifen was hard for her. And I hear that, but there are also other ones too. So it's really interesting. And you have to, I just want to say, be your own advocate, you know, push, mm -hmm. keep looking, get, third opinions and fourths. Go ahead, Allison. No, I agree. And so that, that's just where I'm at now. So I, I think also advocating and uh, I wish, uh, you know, I had been getting checked all those years. I didn't even, because there was only a 1%, they kind of just are like, wash their hands of me and that and was it, it. And I didn't know that because, you know, Allison and I, of course, stayed in contact. And if I had known that she wasn't getting checked at least once a year, I would have been, because that's just who I am. I'm just, I'm everybody's, <laughs> I would have been like all over her. I mean, I'm not kidding. My, my um, 
eye doctor, every year she sees me, she's like, oh, I got to go for my mammogram. I'm like, yes, you do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it's really important that people realize that you can, there is a doctor standard of how often they'll want to see you at the beginning. It's every three months and then it can go to six months and then it can go to every year. It's what you feel comfortable with. I'm still six years out and I have never been comfortable with, with waiting six months because for me, I'm afraid if it comes back, it'll be too far along. So I go more often, but that's my prerogative. They can't tell me well, no. They told me if the next time it comes back, it comes back to kill me. So I, uh, it was one of the reasons why I went on the drug trial because they're forced to see me every month for five years. Every month they give you that shot. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll take, I'll take the pain uh, and the hot flashes in order to, to live, live out my life. Live your life, exactly. And that's kind of, it's interesting because we're talking about this during the time of COVID and people act like this is such a major inconvenience, but like a year or two out of your life, when you could live to a hundred, you know, you just, you just, they don't really realize the ramifications of it. Um, we're getting close to noon. So I just want to loop back around and ask Ramsey because she's got the first heart out. So did it, did it affect the way people, I know you didn't share it with everybody at work, which, you know, it's probably wise, you know, I, I, I don't know that it was, I couldn't not, I mean, I had to take, literally I took seven months off of work. I could not work. I couldn't walk. Um, yeah, so, if, especially if you're getting chemo, people are going to know. Yeah, I, I, I didn't do, which we'll talk about in a minute, because at the time I was starting chemo, they were starting to offer something called a cold cap that you could put on your head. And I was like, cold cap? And I heard it was kind of painful and needed all these people to help you. And I was like, nah, forget it. Yeah. So Stevie got it. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. First, That's I what it looks like. It's very glamorous. <laughs> but um so Ramsey did you feel like there was anything did it affect your career at all you're you're muted she's, she's so cute all right all right Don't um, be. it's interesting because you know when I was diagnosed emotionally I was went very internal it really took me to my knees I knew I wasn't going to die um but it was extremely emotional and my coping mechanism was not to tell anyone because I didn't want to engage and I just needed to work my own emotions out right my own drama out you know since then um I've had a I had a really close friend of mine pass away from cancer and she didn't tell anyone and I went to the funeral and um, we, it was hundreds of people and no one knew. And everyone was really sad that she had passed and, you know, it was a funeral and there was tears and laughter and memories, but everyone felt a little bit awkward over not having had the opportunity to discuss with her, all, you know, share the memories with her um share the experience with her so if i had to do it again i would tell everyone you would i would because um it is a sorry if you have you know you know god forbid anything happens your friendships and your family and your close ones um, um it's important to connect and stay connected and share and it's a it's a healing process that I didn't really have the first time around, um, you know. So I would do it again. Now I I, I kind of feel like it was my own Capricornian way of being very stoic. It was very it it, it had the, my its ramifications too because it was all just kept inside, right? So you're, you're a Capricorn, huh? That's like yeah. my dad. He kept his to himself too. Yeah. Um. I will say though too, so, so did it affect my career? It certainly did um, allow me to ca categorically separate my emotion from fact and deal with things very categorically and robotically <laughs> during that time. And it probably saved me in a way, right? It, I remember the few people that did know that I was going through it recognized the toll of radiation and, I, and to a degree, I didn't even see it. Yeah. I did, not, I did not realize to what degree it just really 
just took out all your energy and um, you know yeah. depleted you, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember at times the the few people that did know would come and do nice things for me, and I'd be like, "Well, what are you doing? I don't need you." And they'd be like, "No, no, you do." And I'd be like, "Oh, okay." And I would <laughs> be like, "Oh, like surprised that they recognized I needed help." Um, but I will say that it was it's interesting. One of the thing takeaways from that time was I I remember going to that biopsy and thinking, "Wow, that biopsy table was not designed by a woman." You know, right? You're, you're laying there. It's not sh shaped to your body. There's no pretending. It's very clinical. Your half your you know, the hole is in the middle where your boob falls through, but half your body's hanging off too like it's not it's just so not made by a woman and since then i totally have conversations with myself about everything like without even recognizing it like oh wow this was not designed by a woman obviously <laughs> you know um and no. so um that was one interesting takeaway but um but so, i yeah can, really quickly so you had a lumpectomy is that right lumpectomy yeah. so you didn't have to have any kind of after that, they got clear margins and everything was fine, right? So yeah, I mean, I ch I could have I chose the path the 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 least invasive invasive way to go. Yeah, I I could have chosen, you know, double mastectomy, chemo, everything. I I just chose the least invasive, and I think it probably is fine, right? Yeah. It ended up being okay, but I think at the time I also felt like I have to work. Yeah. I really can't deal with this. I can't show any visible signs of weakness. We I, can't show, I don't want to, I just don't want to deal with this. Like this is the worst. I, it was the worst timing. Like it's never good timing, but I was like, this is like, I can't deal. So that was whether good or bad, that was part of my thinking to oh. be honest. Absolutely. And it's interesting because the thinking has changed over all the years. In the very beginning, you know, talking before we were born, you know, people were getting breast cancer and they were automatically removing the breasts no matter what. It was only, I think, what, when I was diagnosed, I remember saying to my breast surgeon, but you can, you're not going to take my breasts, right? Like for me, that meant I, was, I couldn't be that bad if she didn't think I needed to lose the breast. And she's like, well, I, we can do a lumpectomy. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm not that bad. It's gotta be pretty small. Cause I had very small boobs. <laughs> and so then I went to a plastic surgeon. She's like, but you need to go see this plastic surgeon. And the plastic surgeon looked at the MRI, which again is done like Ramsey's talking about where you basically lay face down with your boobs through this kind of these holes. It's the most expensive bra you'll ever wear. And my, my the most uncomfortable. And the most uncomfortable. And my um, plastic surgeon, who I still use to today, I adore her. She's in Santa Monica as well. She said, um, I'm sorry, why are you getting a lumpectomy? And I'm like, well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, why? What are you talking about? And she's like, it's really big. I think that they're, because, you know, MRIs are still two-dimensional. She's like, I think it's going back further than you realize. And I think you need to think about doing a mastectomy. And then it was like, okay, a mastectomy. And I just got comfortable with that. And I texted... Allison, another gal, and Julie Hale, who was also, um, was, was Belinda, was she one of your bosses at one point, right? Early on, right? So she had, she had gone through two bouts of cancer and she was actually out fighting her second bout, her reoccurrence when I was diagnosed. And I remember reaching out to her towards the end of her treatment and I said, what would you do? She's like, Monica, if I knew then what I knew now, I would take them both. And, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. And I said, well, I'm going to, I'm gonna get one taken off. And I sent this text, this group text, and they're all like, just one? And I'm like, oh my God, people, I just I just agreed to lose one. And they're like, no, take them both. So, you know, it wasn't just because they said so. It, it, my doctor was great. She made me fill out a priorities li list of like what's most important to you. You know, and it was to live as long as possible and grow old with my husband, have the least amount of surgeries. Because if you do just one breast, you can not do a reconstruction and you can wear a false or you can get a, a an implant or use another part of your body to, to rebuild it but then the other one won't match and so for me a little bit like allison was saying i was like 
it was not really, it was vanity, but it was more like, well, they're going to have to do surgery anyway to tweak it. We might as, I might as well just get rid of them. And just start well, over. Well, I think my mom ended up getting breast cancer right before COVID on her other boob that she didn't remove. Oh so like. First, let's not scare Ramsey though. Cause it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I just, I also just think like to your, to everything you just said, and also just to go back to my decision about little path of least resistance it was not without multiple second third fourth fifth opinions true and, and i think what's really, really interesting about where we are today versus where we are were maybe in the 70s 80s even 90s with breast cancer and the biopsies and just the level by which they can detect cancer cells now i mean it's so great now it where, and to the degree where i had one doctor say you know, in, in the 80s, this would be undetectable. And you could live your full life without ever being diagnosed as cancer. So there are these ideas, there, there are different ideas of what a cancer cell is and what, what are, is, is precancerous cells cancer or is, or is it precancerous cells? I mean, and it's, it's, there's a divide in, in, in medicine about it. Um, at least there was five years ago when I was diagnosed, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. You know, it's a story in itself, right? Um, but I, 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 so, so now the current thinking really is to try to preserve the breast. So a lot of doctors will recommend a lumpectomy if it's very small and people need to know that that's, that's, um, that's okay. You know, so so it's really important to get the best team um, that you possibly can around you to help make those decisions. But I, I am wondering, and if Ramsey, you need to jump off, no worries. We adore you for sharing your story, and we thank you, um, thank you so much. Seriously, so much love to you. Um, but I do want to hear from the rest of you ladies as far as like work, and I want Stevie to talk a little bit about her, <laughs> the fact that she had that amazing skull cap that I didn't do and I of course went I went bald like within they said well, within days. I just have to go but I because I have this meeting that it is I it could not move and it's like a huge meeting about a movie but um did the skull cap work did did it keep your hair well yeah I kept I would say I kept most of it I lost probably about 30 percent of my hair so this is all still because I stopped chemo in February so I have um, I don't know if you could, that, that's all come back in since February, but, um, I, yeah, I got to keep most of it and it was, it was a big help. It was painful as hell, but it was a big help. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. You didn't, I mean, I would, I saw her all along the way. We talked and what have you, and you couldn't, you really couldn't tell because I mean, the hair was there, you know, yeah. it was thinner yeah. to you, but I couldn't tell. Yeah. I would say if you have the opportunity to if unfortunately you get diagnosed with cancer and you have to go do chemo, and if you have the opportunity to be able to get the uh, cold cap, then I would suggest doing it. Like I said, it was, um, it felt like, you know, it's basically they're, they're freezing your entire scalp. So they put this thing on your head and it, it's, it's really uncomfortable and almost painful to a point where I couldn't even talk to my husband who was with me for about a half an hour to 45 minutes while this thing was freezing my scalp, because it feels like a uh, brain freeze, but it's, over your entire head. So you know how much that hurts just right here. It's yeah. that all over your head. And you're like, oh God, <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it. So, you know, and I lost the part on the top of my crown because the skull cap didn't um, press down quite and didn't make contact with my scalp right there. It's just, you know, that's just the way it's. It's, it's interesting because for me, so they said to me, you may or may not lose your hair. You know, I, I always had, I always had long hair and I'd cut it to here and donate to kids with cancer over and over again. So my hair grew like weeds and it was, it was beautiful hair. I mean, I'm not going to, that's one thing I had that was gorgeous with my hair. And so when they said, you know, you may not lose it. So just, just wait, don't shave your head. That, that could be, you know, premature, but if it's going to fall out, it'll happen within like within 14 days and to the day clumps started coming out. And I was like, you know what? I'm not doing this. And I went out on a weekend and I'll never forget my hairstylist. And my husband was there and one of my best friends, Holly Bratton came and they shaved my head and it was really empowering. Bye. Mm. 
Bye, Ramsey. And it was really empowering Bye, to me. I have to go. I'm so sorry. Thank Don't you. Don't so worry. Much. I love you. Thank you so much. Okay. See you soon. Um, and you know, I never grew my hair back. I've just decided to go with a mohawk because when I was in school, I always used to think I'd love to have a mohawk one day, but my hair was so long. It just was not something I would ever entertain doing. And I kind of rock it. So I've just decided just to leave it as is. Belinda, tell us about, did it affect you work? Did you, I mean, I kind of, I remember, you know, talking to you about it and you were trying to make some decisions about, do I, should I do chemo or not? Because you were kind of, you know, they look at numbers. Yes. Yes. That was um, a big one for me. And I think, you know, um, just kind of piggybacking off of what Ramsey had spoken about with regards to her diagnosis and just her feeling and reasons why she didn't want to share because it was such an emotional thing for her. I think for me, I, I kind of took it more emotionally, but also addressing your question with work, I, because I had two kids like to think about <laughs> at my diagnoses um, and throughout my career, I feel very grateful because I feel like I've always been blessed to have had opportunities and have had leaders who've really supported my own priorities in life as I've gone through my different phases. So at the time I had a 10 year old and a five year old. And all I could think about was, do I mention the big C to them? Like at this time, my 10 year old obviously knew enough and he'd heard enough about cancer. And I was like, you know, thinking about it with my husband, we were debating, do we tell them, oh, mommy's going to just be going to the hospital. And then I said, but what about if I had to get chemo, you know, they're going to really see it. So long story short, I decided I was just going to hit it head on and just be brave and tell them because I thought it could be a teaching moment. I knew I was going to fight it without a doubt. I was like, I'm there, my reason. And I, I would not take no for an answer anyway. So I said, I'm going to fight it. And I want them to be, able, to be able to see what it's like to fight something like cancer. Yeah. So I remember having those conversations with my two kids. And of course, immediately, and I'm going to start oh, crying. Um, I wasn't fatalistic about it. But my older son, you know, he was just very calm when I told him, you know, mommy has cancer. And then his next question was, oh, God. he goes, are you going to die? Like I said, well, you know, that's not where my head went, but I had to, you know, address that with him because that was his fear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, literally they were my reason. I went back to work and I remember telling my leaders and they were all so supportive. They said, you have to do what you need to do. And, you know, with production, I just didn't feel like it was fair for them to leave them and say, I'm going to be here one day out of three weeks during my chemo sessions. And I just thought, you know, if, if we, we could make this work, I'll just take the full, you know, however long it would take, which at the time, I think there was like 16 months left in production. So I was gone for six. And when I came back, the movie was still, you know, the rest of the movie yeah. was still there, which is the great <laughs> thing about animation. Um, it's just a long, hard, arduous process, but I was able to still come back. And when I came back, I just felt more alive. Like, honestly, I know I was wearing kind of the face of cancer because I had lost all my hair. The cold cap thing was brought to me as an option at the time, but I don't think it was very advanced yet. So they didn't know what, what it really was. So um, my doctors didn't push for it. So I went head on and I started again, same thing as you, lost my hair, I was in the bathroom, 14th day. And I just I, you know, it, it was like a bird's nest. Like, I, I don't want to go into details, but it just felt so clumpy. And I was just in the restroom and I said, you know what? I, I shut the restroom door. I took my brush and I started brushing my hair because I was afraid to brush it up until that time. I was just keeping it up in a ponytail to preserve it. Hey, stay. Yeah. And I was the same thing. I had long hair, which right before chemo, I ended up cutting just to say, okay, you know, if I'm going to lose my hair, I have less to lose. So I was in the bathroom just, you know, brushing my hair. And before I knew it, I had a whole trash can full of hair. And my husband was knocking on the door because I'd been in there so long. He's like, are you okay? And I was like, you know, I just need a moment. Like, literally, I just said, I just need a moment to myself. I'm just going to sit here for a little bit. But, you know, looking at it, I think that it was the right decision in terms of work. I was able to come back. Um, I remember I had a conversation with the president of the studio when I came back and he said, you know, for a while there, I wasn't sure if you were going to come back because I can respect that a lot of people, um, go, having gone through this, take a different perspective in life. And my reaction was, you sure. know, very true. And I know, and I respect everyone's decision, but I said, for me, I felt like it empowered me because what it ended up doing was it took the fear out of a lot of things that I, I would use to fear. Yeah. Which I actually, I'm going to ask you to pause for a second because Allison's got to jump off, but I do want to talk about that. If you don't mind, 
if you guys can stick around for a couple more minutes because I think it's really important. Um, so Allison, thank you so much. Is there any kind of final words you want to say or just to get a pop off? Um, I would just say um, be your own advocate. Um, and if there's things you want to do, I, we, there was a couple questions in there like, you know, if uh, I'm going through treatment, should I like, uh, uh, is it okay to job hop between this? Like I pivoted my whole career right during chemo. So I think, yes, if you feel up to it, but listen to yourself and, and what you, you, you feel you're capable of. And then I think don't wait for life alternate, alternating like moments of your life to make changes. If there's something you really want to do, if, there's a career that you want, if there's places you'd want to go um, after COVID, um, then I would say do it, uh, do it, because um, you, whether it's cancer or something else, you just don't know what the, that time clock looks like. And then I think the other is like, if you end up knowing somebody who's going through treatment, like, I think the best thing to do is to uh, be there for them. Don't ask them what they need, just do things like drop food off, start a meal train, start a uh, GoFundMe, like just do, be proactive versus asking because when you're sick, yeah. you don't want to think about it. And, and also don't, you don't offer weird, you need, weird advice. And you don't know what you need. I mean, when you're, when you're like, when someone says to me, when they'd said to me, is there anything I can do or what can I do for you? I, I don't even know. You, you can't even focus. And the, and it's true, uh, Allison was just, I think, about to say the thing that I always say, which is, if you are not a survivor, if you haven't gone through cancer, you don't want to say to somebody, a colleague, a friend, a family member, um, you're going to be fine. It's, it feels so dismissive to the person who has it. The best thing you can say is, I'm here for you, and I will be, for, yeah. I will be at your side every second. And also, don't, don't recommend coffee enemas as a cure for my cancer. That's oh my that my, my least favorite. Co the coffee enema. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that one. Oh my gosh. Yes. Like, yes. If I only I, did the coffee enema, I wouldn't be going through stage two. Great. Yeah. Allison, drive carefully. I know you've got to take off. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Have a great weekend, everybody. You too. So Belinda was just starting to talk about this. Allison kind of mentioned it too. And it's something that I think is important, you know, um, to talk about which is how it changes your life there's the there's the what i call you know bc before cancer right and then the ac after cancer and so i know that for me there were things that i feared or i was a workaholic i mean i worked 100 hour weeks i was working so much and i took on so much stress and put myself second and then for me being out for seven months and again thinking I really thought I was going to die. So coming back, I realized I became just much more in tune with myself spiritually. I became, I got into meditation. I came back to Disney the same way. I was like fearless. You know, it's like the only thing I fear is losing a loved one or being diagnosed again with cancer, but there's nothing else I fear. Yeah, you know, I called it my, I lived through my worst nightmare. Now what's my new nightmare? <laughs> I kind of went through that. That was kind of my new after cancer approach to life. And I just said, I'm not going to wait for my new nightmare. I'm just going to go ahead and continue living life. And, you know, when I said it takes the fear out of a lot of things for me, I even took the fear out of cancer because at one point in my life, when I hear other people's stories about going through cancer, I was like, oh my God, that must be so awful. And I, I couldn't even imagine, but well, now you're, you're a survivor. And then you, you kind of think about what can I do with this? Right. And you know, I hate to say it, after my diagnosis, I've had many other people come and, and approach me and share. And Stevie was one of them, which I was actually there with, with Stevie at TVA. So I'm so happy that the cold cap worked for you because I've actually heard a, a lot of success stories there. But my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer just last year. Oh so she ended up having a single mastectomy. And then one of my closest aunts, her, her sister-in-law, got diagnosed this year. So, you know, I think the hope for me is just knowing that I, as I'm seeing there are more diagnoses happening, I'm hopeful because I think the survival rates are also getting, they're also growing because even though the number of diagnoses are increasing, the survival rate's increasing because we're finding it sooner. There's more advancements yeah. in treatment. So I find that, you know, I'm, I'm, I decide, I'm taking the, the decision to make it positive in my life. Like I choose to live my life half glass 
full as opposed to the other way. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I, I would say the bad news is you got breast cancer. The good news is you've got breast cancer because breast cancer is one of the most supposedly from what I hear survivable ones. It's the one they've made the, some of the most uh, biggest advancements on in the last five to 10 years. Yeah. And I mean, just the fact that I know you guys, right? You know, I know you, Belinda, I know Monica, I know my friend, Wendy, her mom went through it, my sister. I have another friend, Laura, who had a double mastectomy like 15 years ago, had cancer. I know so many women that have had it that are still here, that that gave me a lot of hope. So when those people would say, you know, I know you were saying, Monica, oh, you don't want people selling, telling you it's going to be okay. But if I hear it from them and I see that they're doing really well, that's, that filled me with a lot of hope. I'm like, okay, this is just going to be, you know, and I just kept, kind of kept thinking of that. Like, this is just going to be a detour in my life, a, a, a speed bump. That's to get through dad. this. That's my you know, dad. And then, okay. And then just, and I, I actually got angry at it. Like, fuck you, cancer. <laughs> like, you know, I got stuff, I, things I want to do, you know, and uh, I got mad, like, how dare you? Um, so that was sort of the attitude I took and then just kind of kept my sense of humor about it too with my husband. Um, yeah, and that's all you can do. But it's yeah, just the fact that there's so many of us out there that are survivors yeah. tells you. Well, it's not a death sentence. Yeah. In the, again, in the old days. It's still and, scary. You know, it was, someone told you you had cancer and it's a death sentence. So I think no one wants to ever be told that everyone wants to hear those words no. and there's much worse cancers um than breast cancer you know honestly you know my dad had prostate his brother had prostate so my uncle their mother my grandmother had breast cancer but all those things like kind of she had it so young and it was a little thing and it was you know so it didn't really occur to me i didn't realize that like that's my ashkenazi juice side of the family and that should have been alarming and I probably should have gone in sooner kind of yeah. like Allison did because I was considered high risk and I know there's been some questions about like you know what is it what you know what does it mean if you get that are you prone to other cancers and and really what I truly believe is that cancer is just a cell that's gone bad and your immune system a good immune system can can knock that out and take care of it but if you're not in a good place if you're stressed if your immune system's compromised if you're overeating like i was during my shows <laughs> getting stressed um it can you know it can allow it to grow and i really do believe that's what happened with my situation as it was just growing from kind of everything my life was just really not in control at that moment and so i definitely live my life very differently do i still get stressed sure you know but not not nearly to the extent that i did before and i'm just I really, I think for me, it put everything in perspective. I love so much more deeply and I have little time for unkind people. I'm just, yeah. you know, I just, I've really weeded. My life's too short to you be around people that are really unpleasant. That's, yeah. you know. Yeah. That was a bit, I mean, it was, sounds very cliche, but it's so true. Like we've yeah. lived through it, right? And so I feel like it gives us more the empowerment to influence others to really say, hey guys, life is too short. And you know, I'm one to actually be able to speak about that in context. So yeah, I think my family is hopefully my at least my kids and my husband, I see them benefiting from this as well, you know, because it influences so many of who we touch in our lives. So absolutely. Yeah. When I have a friend who's like or a family member who's going through something like drama with people, I'll say to them, look, I don't want to see you have to get sick yeah. to make you to, to snap you out of it and make you realize that this is not a priority and to get your priority state because that's what happened to me you know i don't you know you i don't talk about religion i am very spiritual i don't believe that there's just one god up there wielding but i do believe that if there's if there was a presence and we're all connected and someone was trying to slap me and tell me monica pay attention and i i, I didn't and again and again and finally it was like all right bitch <laughs> we're going to take you out of the game for 7 months and you are going to change and i did yeah so and yeah. and i i just want to add too that um you know going through cancer is really really not fun and scary and everything but i realized how much people liked me <laughs> i don't know how to how to say that but how like, you know, you just like, oh, you know, and as soon as you would tell people you have it, then it's like everyone, it's kind of like, you know, when people are always talking about how much they love somebody at their funeral, but they're telling you now. Yes. You know? 
And it's so great to hear that. So that's the one tiny positive that I could take away from this is that I know that a lot of people do care about me and love me. And I did not necessarily know that before, you know, how much. Totally. And it was, it's, so that's been really nice. And that's been really special. I have to say, I'm so glad you said that because I felt like I might be one of the only people that thought that because there was such an outpouring, you know, I was at Disney at the time and, you know, I'd have 300 people on a film. And so, you know, I wanted to make sure everybody knew because of the person I am that I wasn't just leaving. So that's why I told everybody, I'm like, yeah. I'm going off to, to do battle or else I'd never leave you on this show without me, you know, yeah. at your side. Um, and the love of and the support, you, you basically do feel like, wow, that's what it would have been like had I died. These people would be sad. Oh my God, that's so yeah. sweet. Yeah. It's bizarre. And it, and it makes you realize too, it's like, you should be saying this to people while they're still here. So that's, that's mm -hmm. probably another little lesson that I've taken away from as well, is that, you know, I, the people that I'm around and friends with and family and everything that, you know, I love you all, you know, and it's like, say that and, and, and let them know that because people don't, don't assume everyone knows that, you know? Right. Don't hold back. Don't be embarrassed yeah. by it. Right? Yeah. Love is great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, we're at 1224. I thank you guys for staying on a little bit longer. Um, I, I know that there were questions and people got answered. So I thank you all for doing that. Um, there was one still open question about good insurance. I think it does depend on the company. So Disney had great insurance. Um, but I also, my husband had, um, Actually, no, it was all my insurance now that I think about it. At that time, he was on my plan. But motion picture was great when we yes. had that. Um, Disney, I, I think I had Anthem Blue Cross, which was great. Um, PPO. Um, and then we have to talk about this, but yeah. It's, it is sad, but somebody did ask a question. And so if, you're, if you don't have good insurance and you think you might be high risk or something, somebody mentioned um, that they got cancer insurance. I didn't even know that that was possible. Oh. Um, and so if that is, you know, that, that might be something to look into. Um, the truth is, the, it, there's a saying that the longer you live, you will never outlast cancer. Because even if you live to 100, generally everyone gets it because it's environmental and it's all these things. So, um, yeah, I would just say make sure you have some insurance. And you're, that, you're, that you're getting your checkups and you're doing it regularly. And, and you're not... Sister, Sorry, my sister will insist on getting a 3D mammogram. She says that's a new a newish thing, and she says if they if you have an option to get that, definitely get it because it will show um, cancer better than a normal mammogram. Yeah, the, mam the normal mammogram is like it's like smashing your breast down in between two plates. Honestly, it doesn't. It's not comfortable at all, and no. I think it's actually I think harder on smaller breasted women than larger breasted women because when you have a bigger breast, there's more to put into the machine to smush. When you don't, they're basically trying to take your chest. <laughs> they're, they're trying, trying to take your chest. And I was like, you're a good woman, take it easy. You know, but um, but um, I did do a blog about, uh, because Allison did one first. So she kind of blogged about her experience. And I think hers were called When Life Gives You Melons. And I think it was on Tumblr, but I'm not sure. And so then I did one on Tumblr called, uh, I think it was called Half Full Cups. Because I had been a you know, oh, my cup is half full, you know, and I never had big breasts. I never quite filled a full, you know, I never quite got to be, I was a full A. So I, I thought that was kind of catchy, but I did document it and it's on Tumblr. And I think it's kind of funny because I, I realized I was a really funny kind of writer as I was going through it. So <laughs> check it out. Um, any last thoughts, any parting thoughts other than I love you ladies so much for coming on. I could get emotional. Yeah, and again, I just want to say to you, Monica, you were one of the first per people I went to and because I knew your situation and I remember texting you and I remember you <laughs> saying, like, replying, you going, oh, shit. And then Belinda, I had heard about you, too, and I realized you were right around the corner from me. So I just want to thank you for being there and yeah. being supportive as well when I found out last year, so. No, it was my honor, Stevie, when I heard it. Like, literally, I feel like as survivors, when you hear the next diagnosis, and it's either it's your family or your friend, your immediate reaction is, 
shit, cancer sucks. You know, it's like, it's, and you can say that because you've lived through it, but then now you just, you have that moment and you're like, okay, let's fight it. You know, you have that realization and you're like, okay, what are we going to do? It's like, yeah. what's the next step? So I am just so honored to be, you know, with you guys and just sharing our stories and our lives together. So thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Bobby. Thank, thank you, you everyone for setting yeah, this thanks, up. Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you everyone for coming. Belinda, Stevie, Monica for moderating, uh, Ramsey, uh, Allison. This is beautiful. So um, really heartwarming and cried a little bit, um, but uh, that's okay. Uh, and I I'm sure we all did. I love that you did. I love that you said that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but uh, I hope you guys, um, I hope you ladies enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yes. And um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend. It's already November uh, leading into the new year, but um, it's great to see everyone again. And uh, this was lovely. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. And we recorded it, so it'll be at some point, it'll be on YouTube, so anyone who missed it, so mm -hmm. just know that, you know, we swear a lot, but it's okay. <laughs> yes. It's all good. Life is too short. It's the passion. It's the passion. Monica, it's the passion. passion. All right. Love you guys. Thank you. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. 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 Take care, everyone.